I think it was in the Documenta in 1977 uh, that uh, for the first time uh, some artists, some official artists of East Germany were invited to contribute. And they came and uh, put their paintings on and some rooms away uh, Georg Baselitz took his paintings off, protesting heavily in all the media against the contribution of these artists. And Baselitz and several other continued until the re reunification uh, to fight against the growing acceptance of East German art, East German poetry, East German literature, East German film. And when uh, suddenly uh, the borders were open and the wall was uh, destroyed, <clears throat> they could not protest anymore. Because from that moment on, uh, this province of art belonged to our provinces of art. And uh, the only thing you could uh, do is to denigrate them, to say these are provinces, these are very bad provinces, this is very bad art. But then came the first uh, young artists from those provinces and uh, they were interesting. Uh, and, um, and this went for the whole of Eastern uh, Europe. Uh, I mean, then came the first uh, Russian artists which were, who were extremely interesting and Czech artists and Romanian artists and uh, now they are everywhere uh, and uh, Ilya Kabakov is in New York and in Paris and uh, uh, this mixture is international and uh, the last ones uh, uh, which we accepted in this museum were the Chinese and the Cubans uh, <laughs> uh, coming uh, from uh, socialist countries. Uh, My Friend Hitler is uh, uh, the title of a theatre play by a Japanese author. Some years ago, I started a material collection of uh, images of Hitler <coughs> in contemporary art. Uh, the first uh, who had inspired me to do so uh, was Anselm Kiefer, uh, who in the 60s had started to make a, uh, a photographic documentation showing himself in, uh, on different uh, hilltops uh, uh, at different places in Europe, uh, <clears throat> lifting his right arm in the famous uh, uh, Hitler salute, um, as if he would conquer uh, these countries around him. Uh, and uh, I regarded this as a a kind of uh, satire and reflection on upgrowing uh, neo-Nazism uh, in Germany and other countries. Uh, and uh, Ludwig bought uh, a sculpture by Baselitz, uh, a sitting man, a big sitting man, which was exhibited at the Biennial of Venice, uh, and it's a big sitting man, and he's rising again, his right arm. 
And again, there were critics uh, saying that uh, 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 German artists uh, are reflecting Nazism in a dangerous way. And I started to collect all this material uh, and uh, found even an interesting old Israeli artist who is living in a kibbutz near uh, Tel Aviv and who does uh, hundreds of drawings with Hitler in the middle of it. And so this was uh, uh, the uh, ambiguous title, uh, My Friend Hitler, uh, suddenly became a certain sense. Uh, uh, and I think uh, uh, it needs today a tremendous courage uh, to do an exhibition uh, like that. And so I didn't find anybody who, who was prepared to do so. And it still stays as a project and might be, it could be a, one day a, a lecture or a book or something like that. Um, but still now, uh, there have been several films in Germany about Hitler, satirical films, uh, tragic films. Uh, uh, the person uh, uh, stands uh, in a very strange uh, aura of uh, monstrosity, uh, and uh, joins uh, other persons uh, uh, like uh, the Cambodian uh, uh, dictator. Yeah, one might find uh, several of them uh, uh, which uh, are no more explained on a political neutral level uh, uh, but uh, as uh, a kind of devils, uh, vampires, devils, uh, monsters. Uh, uh, unhappily, this message uh, it does never reach those neo-Nazis uh, uh, which crop up everywhere in our countries. Uh, the collector Peter Ludwig, um, in his youth in Koblenz on the Middle Rhine, uh, was uh, part of the youth movement of the uh, Nazi regime. Uh, he was in the Hitler Jugend, uh, and he uh, seems to have been. Uh, very clever press officer in his youth. Uh, in the last days of the war, his uh, mother was killed during a bombardment, uh, during a bombing. Um, and whenever he was asked later why he had made a doctor thesis on Picasso, in 1947, two years after the war, he said he wanted to open himself to other countries. He didn't want to make a doctor thesis on German Expressionism. He didn't want to do anything about German. He felt humiliated as a German by the catastrophe uh, of the war end. And uh, whenever I ask him, when did you feel like a German? When were you proud to be a German again after this humiliation? He said, 1957, when the Germans won the world uh, championship of soccer. And this went for many old Germans of that generation. 
uh, they were proud. At the first time, they were proud and they thought they were allowed to be proud. Now, Ludwig's interest in uh, Eastern countries uh, and in Cuba had a strange conf uh, a consequence. He admired the leaders of these countries. And as Fidel Castro was the only uh, leader who uh, still lived, Stalin was dead, Khrushchev was dead, Brezhnev was dead. Um, so he had an audience with Fidel Castro. And we waited for him in Havana after that and asked him how was it and uh, and he said it was fantastic. Uh, you know, he asked me if uh, Emil Ludwig was my father. Now, Emil Ludwig was a writer in uh, Germany who published many monographies about famous people uh, in the 20s. And Fidel Castro must have read one of these books by Emil Ludwig. And when he met Peter Ludwig, evidently he thought he was an acquaintance or a, a relative of Emil Ludwig. So Ludwig liked uh, to be, uh, uh, to converse with uh, these people, with powerful people. And uh, his entourage, uh, his friends, me, uh, uh, we thought this rather eccentric. Uh, we didn't like him for that. And suddenly he started uh, to visit the old Arno Breker, who lived at that time near Dusseldorf and who had been uh, the official sculptor of Adolf Hitler. And uh, he asked Arno Breker to make his portrait and the portrait of his wife. And uh, we couldn't believe it. And he bought a big sculpture by Arno Breker, a bronze of uh, uh, the uh, of an antique hero which stands still in front of the villa of the Ludwigs uh, in Aachen. And when I did uh, uh, this book at his 70s birthday to present it to him, uh, it is called Peter Ludwig and the Volkswagen. Because the first pop art painting which Ludwig bought was the painting of a Volkswagen by Tom Wesselmann in 1966. At that time, uh, Volkswagen had an advertisement company in New York uh, which uh, uh, made a wonderful advertisement campaign about what Volkswagen, what a Volkswagen can do. And the Americans started to love Volkswagen as a second car or as a student's car. Uh, Volkswagen became very popular uh, thanks to this uh, publicity agency. And uh, in a way, Ludwig wouldn't have bought a painting of an American car but it was a Volkswagen, it was a German car, and he was a German. So he was proud that an American artist painted a German car. And the whole book goes about that, and it has uh, in its inside uh, a comparison of a portrait of Ludwig by Arno Breker and another portrait of Ludwig made by an official Soviet artist who is completely unknown here. Uh, 
showing how much this, uh, uh, these traces of nationalism, of national, national pride, uh, uh, can be present, can be visualized in such works and such comparisons. Um, I wanted to uh, to show in this exhibition of which the book is the testimony I wanted to show um, an image of Venice of the Biennale of Hans Hake where he uh, transformed the German pavilion, which is itself a building of the Nazi regime, uh, in destroying the floor and putting the big uh, uh, line Germania uh, over it. So this is a reflection uh, about uh, uh, the attitude uh, towards uh, nationalism and uh, towards national socialism, uh, which uh, was always very near to us and which is still part of the Ludwig collection. Uh, all those uh, who are engaged in uh, the distribution of art and information, distribution of information about art uh, have changed their rhythm uh, extremely. Uh, I mean, it was never uh, so easy to exchange information about art. Uh, it was never so easy uh, to uh, send information to some place and have a book made at the other place. Uh, uh, when I remember uh, how difficult it was to communicate in the time when I started uh, with a typewriting machine and uh, uh, with um, a single telephone in the whole museum. <laughs> uh, and all these uh, small things. And when I uh, remember the joy we all had when the first little video machine came up and I was friends with the man of the Philips laboratory here in Aachen and he brought me the first uh, 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 video recorder and we had the first uh, Sony open reel recorders uh, and the whole sound system and we uh, explored it in the museum uh, uh, and uh, invited people uh, to use it and we had a sound system in the whole museum uh, where we could uh, for instance uh, communicate a telephone conversation with an artist who lived on an, in another city uh, so he informed us about what he was preparing and it went through the whole museum. All this was uh, extremely exciting. Uh, and uh, when I see that uh, the old David Hockney is now uh, exhibiting in the Cologne Museum uh, large works which have been made uh, uh, with a pencil uh, following a program on a tablet or uh, on a smartphone, uh, landscape drawings which can be quickly then sent over and printed uh, I think this is a, a tremendous uh, progress and uh, we can only very slowly evaluate it what it means uh, uh, for us it's an additional line uh, the distribution of art is accelerated extremely. The production of art is not. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I think the production of art needs uh, leisure, needs time, needs reflection, needs uh, 
turning back uh, uh, to, to thinking about... Uh, I mean, human imagination has its own uh, uh, acceleration, its own time. Uh, and uh, therefore, they, it is necessary to make a big difference between the two of us, uh, the two of, uh, of the production. The distribution is accelerated, uh, the production is not. The answer is very, uh, very complicated because uh, evidently there are no borders uh, anymore and uh, 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 the internet allows uh, international communication. Uh, uh, there's no difficulties anymore in our countries. I mean, there, there are censor, uh, censorship difficulties in China or in other countries. Uh, or in Iran, uh, it is uh, difficult to communicate to Iran, uh, but here there are none. Uh, but uh, if you uh, regard the visitors, for instance, of the Ludwig Forum, uh, it is interesting to observe that half of the visitors are Dutch. So the Dutch are very, very curious and like to leave their small country uh, and go out and uh, get cultural informations from abroad. Uh, in their television they see a lot of films in different languages because it is not uh, recommendable that all these films are synchronized into Dutch. Um, the Belgians uh, are very much uh, inclined uh, to concentrate on francophone countries, to France, uh, and they go to Brussels. I mean, my friends in Liège, uh, they are only my friends because I speak French. Uh, uh, otherwise, they, would, uh, they wouldn't communicate with me. They cannot. Uh, they have di even difficulties in English, uh, and, uh, but they love it uh, to talk to me and they love me because they invite me regularly to uh, take part at their artistic meetings, at juries, and, uh, because I, I know their language. Uh, uh, and for a certain time, when I lived in Belgium, I was regarded as a Belgian. Um, when we did in 2000, we did a big exhibition uh, regarding this region as uh, a kind of model of the world with all their difficulties and inviting about 100 artists. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it was called uh, the Intercontinentale, Intercontinental Exhibition. Uh, and uh, we made it in the museums around. We took the Museum of Maastricht, of Heerlen, of Liege, and of Aachen, <clears throat> and we made little bus travels through the museums. And that was very interesting to see. The, uh, so the Chinese artists were in Liege, and the um, Cuban artists were in Heerlen, and so uh, we played with the continents uh, in this little uh, area. I think this can be interpreted positively uh, in, uh, in a multicultural situation. You start to love the otherness of the other and you warn him not to be like yourself uh, because you need it. You need an uh, some other person who is completely different. And uh, even if a person uh, who has the same cultural background as you have changes 
to another cultural background, like the Muslim, like the Imam. Um, you, you find that wonderful. Uh, I mean, it, it's so enriching. You get suddenly, I mean, I love Arab literature. I love uh, A Thousand and One Nights. Uh, uh, and uh, I love to talk to Arabs because they are still full of such stories. And uh, I always admired in Moscow the Russians uh, because most of them read far more than we do uh, because television is very bad in Russia and was very bad before 89. It was state television only. So nobody looked at it. Uh, they read books and uh, they knew immensely about books. Uh, and I thought this was wonderful. And um, uh, I always was very much inspired by the otherness of people. Uh, and I was never afraid. Uh, and still now I, I don't know why people are afraid. Uh, uh, I laugh at them when they explain that they are afraid of approaching somebody who is other, who has another uh, skin color or another cultural background. <laughs> uh, you know, we, uh, we had these experiences with Eastern European uh, socialist uh, uh, realism, uh, uh, state art, and uh, uh, when uh, suddenly uh, we approached uh, the art in Havana, uh, uh, we expected the same. Uh, it would be uh, an art of hiding, uh, an art of uh, timidity, an art uh, of uh, state indoctrination. And we found uh, a completely different situation. Uh, there was no in, uh, indoctrination at all. There was uh, quite a liberal situation at the uh, uh, State Academy, a wonderful atmosphere, but an extreme poverty. Uh, and uh, a poverty combined to pride uh, and to let me say, uh, southern Mediterranean uh, uh, lust of life, uh, uh, musicality, uh, bodily movement, dance, uh, uh, and a kind of uh, sad happiness. Uh, strange, very strange atmosphere. And the pride was uh, uh, strange too, uh, uh, intimidating. I remember Lilian Janis, uh, uh, the director of uh, the uh, Biennale of Havana, a very capricious and uh, uh, demanding lady. Um, and. Uh, we decided, uh, we decided we should do it. We made an exhibition of the Biennale of Havana. Uh, uh, we took it over from Havana. <clears throat> and uh, this was the biggest exhibition the Ludwig Forum ever did. And. Uh, the most difficult, because uh, most of the artists came from uh, the most different countries of uh, South America uh, and uh, Europe. And uh, Lilian Glanis came, and uh, 
we had prepared the, the house, we had emptied the house of everything, uh, put the collection at the side, and then they filled the whole house. Um, uh, and um, yeah, they demanded a lot. Uh, uh, and we liked it, uh, but uh, we felt a bit m masochist, uh, as if uh, uh, they would uh, treat us badly and punish us uh, to be, uh, in their sight, rich capitalists. <laughs> <laughs> A part uh, of these works stayed in Aachen, in the collection. Ludwig bought them. Uh, and uh, these, this exhibition had uh, consequences. We made more exhibitions of Cuban art afterwards. We invited individual artists uh, and uh, became friends with them. And uh, uh, Ludwig uh, uh, started to give regular subventions to the Ludwig Foundation in Havana, uh, which is uh, not a big amount, uh, uh, but uh, it gives to the Ludwig Foundation the privilege of being an international foundation in Havana, uh, where not many international uh, institutions exist. Uh, We made a big uh, catalog of the collection, of the Cuban collection, and I, sting, I think the cooperation still continues. Well, I was uh, fascinated uh, by a book about the beginning of philosophy in Europe uh, by a Turkish writer, Oya Erdogan, which has as a title Wasser. Because one of the first philosophers in Greece, of whom we know very few details, is Thales. Uh, and Thales has n left nothing written, but many of the philosophers like Aristotle refer to Thales, and so we know about him through the philosophers uh, of the next generation. Uh, Thales has uh, started a theory uh, about water uh, and uh, the origin of the world. Now, he lived in a time uh, when the uh, animistic, mythological conception of the world changed into a scientific conception. Uh, until then, water was populated by Neptune, by Nereids, by Amphitrite, by Nymphs, by many, many uh, uh, strange uh, beings. And from that moment on, it became water. And it became H2O. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, Thales uh, developed thoughts about the origin of the world in which he said that uh, the, the globe is not uh, spheric, but it could be regarded as a water drop. It is like a water drop. And uh, I loved uh, uh, these ideas about being on the border between mythology and science. Because 
this is exactly where, in my opinion, art is. This is art, a strange sphere, a narrow sphere between mythology and uh, science, uh, research, rational on one side, and uh, storytelling and legends producing on the other. <clears throat> And talking about water, uh, I love to talk about pure and impure water. Like I like to talk about pure and impure art. And as you have seen, uh, I have met uh, in my life a lot of pure and a lot of impure art. And with impure art, I would mean those arts which are dictated, which are uh, arts which are demanded, which are paid for, uh, and which are indoctrinated uh, by somebody uh, who uh, wants to be an artist himself. I mean, people, dictators like out of Hitler or uh, Joseph Stalin, they certainly wanted to be artists themselves. Uh, and in a certain way they were. Uh, they were terrible artists. Uh, and uh, most of the artists they employed produced impure art and not pure art. And it seems a very difficult thing uh, to imagine somebody who can produce pure art, uh, independent uh, of all coercions of all forces from outside, uh, producing just uh, a line, a dot, uh, something which is pure. So I started to love pure water. And it's very difficult to find pure water in our regions. Uh, uh, so pure water seems to be old water, very old water, which has been hidden uh, under surfaces uh, where water uh, became impure. And uh, I started to look for people who search uh, experiences with water. So I started to work with water artists. Uh, uh, I started to work with an artist who uh, constructed hydrophones uh, to find the sound of water deep in uh, lakes and in streams and who notated water. Or I looked for painters who painted uh, swimmers, uh, like uh, this uh, artist in Aachen uh, regularly paints swimmers in a simple pool uh, in uh, Aachen, and she has made a whole research uh, uh, about uh, swimmers and about uh, the consequences of regular swimming. Or I was fascinated by that work by Linda Treller, uh, who went through the world and uh, uh, photographed uh, <coughs> uh, people who dived into water or let me s look for a good image yeah like that <coughs>
who dive into water, into hot water, and who uh, look for healings. And I think I will continue to uh, work in this realm as I'm living in a town which has uh, the privilege of the hottest springs uh, in Europe north of the Alps. So why not use these springs and why not uh, invite artists uh, to work with these springs?